the title is the high temperature superconductivity uh, given by uh, Professor Deng Hai Li, you know, uh, uh, one of our uh, faculty members. So today, you know, the, we, we, we are very delighted not to have Professor you know, Edmund Hughes you know, coming you know, to visit us and also you know, the, give us a okay, colloquium on uh, you know, one of uh, his uh, research activities. Uh, Emron uh, got uh, his PhD in, okay, from uh, Columbia. Then uh, after that, then uh, he's, he spent some time okay, at SLAP uh, before you know, the, he uh, picked up a faculty position at uh, Caltech. And then uh, in 2006, you know, the, then he decided you know, to move to Columbia, which is closer to CERN, so then you know, he can travel less you know, to work on his experiment. Um, you know, Emron you know, has done okay, you know, quite a lot of uh, you know, the work in many different areas. Uh, you know, he, he was a leader of okay, several uh, the stack experiments using you know, the electron you know, to study you know, the, you know, some of the fun fundamental properties of, uh, you know, say, the, the, uh, the nucleons. And uh, he also, you know, okay, the, uh, a member of uh, Atlas, uh, SLD, and also STAR, so ranging from nuclear to particle physics. And uh, currently, you know, the, he is uh, involved in another electron uh, scattering experiment at JLab, and also you know, the, he the teams up with uh, you know, some of the colleagues you know, the, in the Columbia Medical School uh, using you know, the helium-3 uh, to do you know, medical research, you know, study you know, say the, the lung, and he told me you know, okay, that actually you know, the lung uh, disease is okay, the third killer okay, the, in the U.S. Um, and also, okay, the, you know, he is okay, the director of uh, the, the K1 project, which is okay, say, the subject that uh, he is going to tell us okay, today. Now, Elman uh, has also okay, the, you know, quite a number of uh, you know, uh, awards and honors. Uh, you know, he was okay, a Sloan okay, Fellow, and uh, he was a okay, Slack uh, Panofsky the Fellow before moving to Caltech, and uh, he is uh, also okay, a Fellow of uh, the American Physical Society. So let's okay, uh, you know, welcome uh, the, uh, the Aaron. Green, can you hear me? Or higher? Okay, good enough. Yeah, okay. Anyway, I scream a lot, so it's not a problem. Um, all right, so first of all, I'd like to thank so much Canview for inviting me here. This is very special. It's more special when it's been a long time. Um, I don't think I've been to Berkeley in at least 10 years. Um, I've moved to the East Coast and pretty much moved in the other direction going across the Atlantic. Um, although you're about to see today that I'm coming like back to the Pacific. Um, and also, I want, um, I did give a colloquium here, actually, but it was about 25 years ago, and it was a job talk, and actually, I'm going to start by saying the story from then that I absolutely should not be telling you. I'm, so, and I even know this is recorded, so this is a really, really bad story, but here it goes. Uh, not, but I just cannot resist telling this crap, this story, um, though I'm going to get lots of trouble for it. Okay, um, when I gave my colloquium 25 years ago, it was a job talk, and I was talking about an experiment that I was in charge of at SLAC, and it was electron scattering experiments scattering off polarized helium-3, and helium-3, I'm still doing research in it amazingly, um, for lung imaging. Um, we were the first ones to get one liter of highly polarized helium-3 into a glass bottle, glass target for an electron beam. And one of the things that we did it was a lot of technology development to get this target working. Polarized targets produced the polar, polarized experiments, so they're tricky experiments always to get things polarized. So an atomic physics technique where you polarize rubidium and it does spin exchange collisions with the helium-3 and then this thing, after many hours, can get highly polarized. Um, the target was about a foot long, it looked like a submarine, and its eye was recorded actually, so if you look back you'll see that this is real. Um, I carried a, um, you know, a dummy target of glass and showed this crowd what it looks like, where the laser beam went, where the electron beam went, 
And I discussed the fact that it was 10 atmospheres of helium-3 in, in, in the target. And it had very, very, very thin windows. It was about 4 mil, 100 micron glass windows. And um, this was important because we scattered through the gas, but it also went through the windows. And we couldn't distinguish interactions that came from the glass window with sun polarized compared to the helium-3. So it was a big dilution factor. And this, this mattered a lot in this experiment. It was one of the issues. Um, so, and I was stressing to this crowd that glass is really strong as long as it's not scratched. And so um, what I had meant to do, I showed the target and it was like, you know, pointing out everything we did. And then I, what I've done in other talks, and I just actually forgot that day to do it at Berkeley, is I take the target made of glass and I bang it on the table and I go, and you can hear about that kind of a noise and it's only um, 100 microns thick glass. And that's kind of impressive. You hear it, and it doesn't break. It's super thin. I'll say, look, there's glass blown. There's no scratch. And this thing, um, therefore, is very strong. And, um, and it's something you can, you know, it's kind of amazing that you can make such thin windows and put, uh, put 10 atmospheres of gas in there of helium-3. So I went back to, gave the talk, whatever. And I went back to Slack. And I was then, I gave a bunch of talks like this. So one morning after the Berkeley Colloquium, and I don't know when, but before my next talk, definitely, um, it was a Saturday or Sunday morning, and nobody was asleep. It was just empty, you know, Saturday morning, 9 a.m. or something. Just no one's there. Okay, everyone worked late. Um, so I was giving a practice talk for my next talk, and I just thought, look, I'll just go through the whole talk again. So I went through the whole talk in my office, just talking to myself. Okay, and I went through the talk, and then I I, I had the cell and discuss it, you know, remember that I hadn't done it, done this thing of banging on the table at Berkeley, and I had done it in previous talks, it wasn't the first time. Obviously, if the cell broke at Berkeley, like, I banged it, I had some joke or line like, oh, well, you know, whatever. I had some way, I don't even remember what that line was, but I was ready for that. I gave the talk, I banged it on the table at Slack, and it exploded. The cell violently exploded, it cut me, it, my ears rang for eight hours. It was so loud. The thing was live. It had heal, 10 atmospheres of helium in it. Shown it like this here, if I banged it on the table, it would have exploded all over the room. Okay, it was loud, everywhere. I have thought, like, for my whole life, how it would have changed if I had decided that day, in this crowd, in this room, if I had done that. And in fact, we, like some of my friends who I swore to secrecy and told about it, um, the ones who made targets, of course, said, well, oh, it's kind of like a loose nuke. You know, it just went out. And uh, so, look, people do make mistakes in life, and they can have consequences. So you have to assume that not everything's going to work. So let's talk about nuclear weapons. <laughs> um, OK, I will get to why I'm showing the bridge of the Saratoga and Bikini Atoll, which was made in 2017. But let, let, let's start. Um, OK, here's an outline of my talk. It's really three topics. I want to spend the beginning just talking about general things on nuclear weapons, comments. And you'll see I'm stealing from one person, but I'm acknowledging that person. Then I'm going to talk about the K-1 project and say what this is. Nobody knows what it is. In fact, I was invited out here to talk about that. And then the main part of my talk is the work we're doing in the Marshall Islands. And I want to discuss that. So first of all, um, news. Let's start with topic one. Um, this, I am stealing from another person. I'm stealing from Panofsky. It's a talk he gave in 2017, and he passed away in 2017. This is probably the last talk he ever gave, and the topic was nuclear weapons. And I've got five slides that I'm literally taking from Panofsky, and I want everybody to see it again, because it hasn't probably changed that much in 10 years. OK, what's shown here is a table of the amount of um, highly enriched material that are, exists in the world today. What's shown is plutonium, highly enriched uranium, and the total amount. And the units are tons. So, there are about 2,000 tons of plutonium in the world, 2,000 tons of highly enriched uranium, and you can add these together to get about 4,000 tons. So I want, there's, there we are. So what is 4,000 tons? I wanted to give people a sense of scale. So this is a 4,000 ton um, floating barge dock. So that's a pretty big thing. And that's, again, we're talking about the world supply, but highly enriched. Um, this is 4,000 tons of gold underneath the street in Paris somewhere. 
um, where it's stored. But you know, it's pretty, pretty heavy. And then here, you could buy this barge. It's a Chinese barge that's being sold that's 4,000 tons a day. So, okay, this is kind of gives you a sense of scale of that number, 4,000 tons. That's the amount of highly enriched material you have in the world. Okay, from Panofsky, um, he also said in the same slide, a significant quantity is 25 kilograms of highly enriched uranium, or 8 kilograms of plutonium is um, a significant quantity. Now, just to get a sense of scale of what 8 to 25 kilograms is, this is a picture of my 6-year-old son. He's 17 kilograms. That's about a year old. I remeasured him for this talk, so it's accurate. So he's about 19 kilograms now. But pretty much, it's the same, same view. And uh, so he's kind of like the critical amount that you need. And what does critical amount need? This is the amount you need to do that. This is Hiroshima, um, 1945, October. I guess I didn't show before. This used to be a city, and pretty much it's uh, a field of dirt now. So this is um, what the significant quantity is. So obviously, the next thing you do, which I'm not going to spend time in, is you divide like that barge by my kid and figure out how many of my kids could you know, make that barge. And it's just obviously a large number. OK, um, another plot. This is not from Panofsky, but this is well known. It is the number of nuclear weapons versus time starting in 1945. And this, this little plot ends in 2014. Um, this is the number of warheads that there are in the world. It was mostly the US and Russia, obviously. This is the arms race, the, the, the buildup here. Um, the average power of these weapons is 20 times Hiroshima because it includes, of course, hydrogen bombs mixed in there. And so you, the, the efficiency, of course, is much, much larger than we had in Hiroshima. Anyway, this goes up. That was bad. It started going down, which is really good. That's the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. But where we are today is over here, and it's still not a really good number, because if you zoom in on that, we have about 10,000 nuclear warheads, but the air bar on that is also really large. You're gonna hear a video as long as it plays, in which a person says it's 23,000. So, so it's, it's, it's a big number, and it depends on what you count as deployable nuclear weapons or not. Okay, um, this is another Panofsky plot. This is the number of nuclear weapon states versus time. And what he noted here is pretty linear over time, that basically every five years there's a nuclear weapon state that was added. The breakup of the Soviet Union was basically these countries were separate until all of a sudden it goes up. But then most of these countries gave up their nuclear weapons, and so the, you know, the curve goes down. Um, South Africa is the only country to ever have owned, had a nuclear weapon, and they got rid of nuclear weapons. One of the issues is countries should be doing that more. Here's North Korea, and then I think without the Iran deal, pretty much you could have predicted that Iran would have been the next one there, and then very quickly it would have Saudi Arabia, blah, 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 blah. But anyway, this is kind of what, uh, this, this is a real curve that's real, and um, it's obviously a bad thing when many, many, many countries have nuclear weapons, and the more complicated, the more likely that they're gonna make the kind of mistake I made in my office. Okay, um, last slide is the US spending on nuclear weapons, the modernization of nuclear weapons. Um, the, import, the only important thing about this slide is these units are not dollars, they are billions of dollars. This is over 25 years, and basically if you add the Department of Defense budget and the nuclear, you know, the, the people who um, control the, the, the weapons, you add these, DOE effectively, if you add these two numbers together, you're getting in 25 years on the order of a trillion dollars. So these are billions of dollars, hundreds of billions, 140 billion. And so the US government is essentially spending and planning to spend one trillion dollars on nuclear weapons, something you're not really gonna use in a war, we hope, and, uh, but it's a trillion dollars that you could, in principle, be spending elsewhere. So anyway, that's the last thing I wanted to say about nukes. Okay, so what is the K-1 project? Um, I got very, I'm hitting Berkeley a little bit here. I got um, really interested in the question, and I'll tell you why, of how much do undergraduate students know about nuclear weapons today? Um, it's not a big topic, and I got interested in that topic in 2011. Here's a paper that I found recently, but it came out in 2011, um, Undergraduate Non-Proliferation Education in the United States. Um, there's not much done on this topic of educating young people except for courses and, and so on. Not, almost no research is done by undergraduates on this topic. Um, but basically, this article looks at sort of courses and what's going on around the country in, in, in terms of weapons of mass destruction. 
This was a, a study done over 10 years. It was started, their interest was 9-11. So 2001, 9-11, um, there, is there an increase in interest in weapons of mass destruction after the 9-11? So that's, that's what this um, article deals with. So I wanted to show one paragraph and read a little bit of it. So first, right after 9-11, this is what was going on um, in the country. In 2002, fewer than one-third of the leading non-military college and universities in the United States offered an undergraduate course devoted principally to weapons of mass destruction issues. So about a third or less. And they only looked at top universities. They were like top, like 30 or 50 or something. So 31%. Um, next, 10 years later, roughly, by 2009-10, more than half of these colleges and universities offered an undergraduate course. Okay, so it had increased in a noticeable way. But then they say, nonetheless, 41% of the nation's top-ranked non-military colleges and universities still lack a course devoted to weapons mass destruction including two of the country's top technical universities, California Institute of Technology and Carnegie Mellon, and the leading U.S. public university, the University of California, Berkeley. Okay, so I don't know in the last five years whether this has changed, but at least according to this, this study, um, Caltech and Berkeley were not like teaching undergraduates weapons of mass destruction. You're allowed to correct it. The, the issue is whether in 2011 this, this is true. Anyway, it's a topic that's kind of um, not generally focused on in the U.S. University. Okay, so I got pulled into this topic because I had to teach a course in science at Columbia. Columbia has something called the core, which means every single student has to take these courses. Mostly it's devoted to issues of literature, but there's one course called Frontiers of Science which every single Columbia College student has to take in order to get a Columbia College degree. They've got to get through this course. And this course was started um, a bit over 10 years ago, and the very first physicist that taught in this course was Horst Sturm. And he taught basically quantum mechanics, and he taught um, nanoscience to 550 undergraduates um, per semester. It's a one semester course. Half the students take it the first semester, and half the students take it the second semester, and you have to get through this course. I was the second person after Horst to, Horst retired from Columbia, I don't know, four or five years into this, and then I took over from him teaching the physics part, and that's where this started. And I, I had to teach, I was asked to teach three topics. One topic was quantum mechanics. They said, well, you have to do it. Horst did it, so you gotta do it too, so fine. Um, second topic was gonna be large hadron collider because I'm teaching that, because that's my research. He was teaching his research, so that, that's that. Um, but then it was seemed like, okay, there's atomic physics, quantum mechanics, there's large hadron collider inside the proton. So I should do something in nuclear physics, like something in the middle. And so I chose nuclear weapons, even though I didn't know it that well. So that was a little bit scary. And then I had to have something that the students would look at or follow that any student, no matter what their background was, could, uh, could address a little bit or, or get some handle on nuclear weapons. And so I chose this book, okay? And not that they would read this book, but this was the guiding book. This was the first lectures on how to build an atomic bomb. It's completely public. It's by Robert Serber. Robert Serber is the right-hand person of Oppenheimer. This is all definitely also a Berkeley story, as is um, Columbia um, at some level. And Serber wrote this book saying in detail basically the physics of building an atomic bomb. And back then, the idea was if you tell people how what the physics is, then it's It'll scare other countries away from, uh, from building the bomb, which obviously didn't work. Okay, so that, uh, in that book, he actually does a lot of order of magnitude calculation using just Coulomb's law. So I introduced the students to Coulomb's law, and I could stop there and compare nuclear energies to, to um, atomic, so chemical weapons versus nuclear weapons, basically. Um, anyway, I was unsatisfied after teaching a one term because I knew, I got lucky, nobody asked me a hard question of the 550 students, but I knew I didn't know this stuff. So I invested one summer and hired six undergraduates um, to work with me as a study group in the summer of 2011. And these six undergraduates, I only chose freshmen. Now it's hard for freshmen to get a job, so they all took a paid job, and it was very competitive to get into this program. And these students were so good in the end, we studied this book, um, I finally found this book by Dick Garwin and George Charpak. 
Um, the future of nuclear power, nuclear weapons. I didn't know anything about nuclear power, so going through this book was actually great, and I got to do it with students. And I chose two, um, six freshmen and created basically a study group in the summer of 2011. This turned out to be so much fun that we had the idea as a group that we're going to do something just wild, and we're going to go, and we succeeded. And to me, this was like, like the just craziest thing we ever did. We went to the Trinity site. Okay? We got ourselves into the White Sand Missile Range and put in a Columbia flag, got this photo, and this to me is kind of awesome. This is the Manhattan Project, right? Like, of course. Um, this is Columbia University freshmen. There are six of them. And we have a shot of at the Trinity site by the end of the summer. And even getting in with all the security and, I mean, fine, they were all U.S. citizens, but still it was tough to, to pull this off. And also, these students are super, super successful today. Like, I do want to say, this one's a journalist, this one's at Stanford Law School, this one's at Albert Einstein Med School, this one's an exec at um, Pepsi-Cola, this one's at Harvard Law School, and this one's at Columbia Med School. So these are really, by the way, the next group, year's group was even better. So, like, this is not, like, so shabby in the end. So anyway, I was so impressed with this group that um, at the end of the day, I decided to, uh, to continue and make this a summer program that kind of goes regular. Um, so, in 2011, I was at CERN. I had to move to CERN that year. Um, so I moved the group and hired the next round of uh, students. They made a documentary on nuclear power in Europe and the comparison between France and Germany and nuclear power, which was diametrically opposed policies. They built a website and they named the k <coughs> project this group. Um, by the way, I'm going to embarrass this person right here. This person is in the room today, and she's like been all over this talk. Um, you'll have, you can look around and figure out where she's sitting. Okay, anyway, um, so Geneva, then in 2013, we wanted to, we were outreaching, we were trying to outreach to young people. Um, and so we decided to go um, and make creative films. Um, Hiroshima Girl, before recently, were like, Real, go out and make a film on nuclear weapons driven by young people, and, and so we spent one year doing that. And then in 2014, I actually had to go to Slack, and so we did because of Atlas. It was right between the down of the energy upgrade. And um, it, the summer got divided into two small groups of filmmakers. One was um, a film devoted to the Marshall Islands, a documentary, and then one was an animated film called Amalia, and these two films were small groups with very talented people in terms of making the film. Um, it was two people who made Amalia and three people who made Marshall and Peace. And they, they got into film festivals and won awards. So the, the, the quality had gone up sort of substantially. And by fall of um, 2014, the young people were pushing that this become a center in Columbia, the first center driven by undergraduates. And it was um, accepted by the provost's office that there's a new center called the K-1, focused on like nuclear issues. Um, okay, here's a... You can go on the K-1 website and see these films. They're short films. This is, um, Avalio is a film about Castro in case, like in an animated film, you can do anything you want, right? Because you like go, so it was a film about what happens if the Cuban Missile Crisis had gone the wrong way. And so this is, this is it's kind of a, kind of was an interesting topic. And then uh, Marshall and Peace I'll come to. Um, the K-1 project, just to sort of summarize what this is all about, Engage in conversation on nuclear weapons, nuclear power, and nuclear proliferation. Focus on age 20, college age student. Raise awareness generally using film. There's been a lot of travel, of course, starting with Geneva and just being at CERN. And also we've had events at Columbia where we've brought in outside experts, Dick Garwin himself and others from the UN because we're in New York City, and to speak with young people. So we've had quite big events. And then we've also recently started looking at research on nuclear contamination in the Marshall Islands. And that's, that's going to be the main part of where I'm heading. Um, here's our website. Um, just like what you, if you go and look at it, we have all these animators. So we have these really cool like cartoon drawings of everything. So it's kind of a, it's a different looking website from that point of view. Okay, now let me jump to the Marshall Islands. So for this part, I would like to show a short video. I don't know, should I keep? The lights on. Yeah, I think. Why don't I kill a few more lights? Maybe. Okay, I'm going to take a minute break and show a two-minute video. It's a trailer for the marshalling piece um, video. We saw the light and we heard the strong noise and 
we saw something coming up from the west. There's nuclear weapons out there. Uh, depends on who you talk to. Up to 23,000 warheads. My fear is, is that we are setting up the conditions today where we, are, we will see ourselves in another few years in another nuclear arms race. We continue to suffer even second and third generation uh, suffering from radiogenic diseases like thyroid, leukemia, and different other cancers, even today. Those of us have experienced what results there are from this testing these horrible weapons. Uh, understand and, and can can attest. There comes a time when we must speak up, otherwise those of us who are around during the testing will be dead and gone. People are being threatened. And not just us, but especially those after us. And it is for them that we must do this. Anyway, this, that was a trailer for the movie that's actually um, posted on our website, so if you're interested. It actually was really, really well done. Again, it was done by students, so it's uh, it impressive. Um, okay, so first of all, where are the Marshall Islands? Just in case someone doesn't know where they are, they're smack in the middle of the Pacific. They're about halfway between Honolulu, ha Hawaii and Australia, and so it's really, really, really remote and really far away. Um, if you zoom in, um, there are 29 atolls. They, basically, these islands are the tips of old volcanoes which have gone underwater. And so there are rings of islands. There are over 1,000 islands here. And um, the Marshallese basically um, live on a number of these islands, in fact. Um, the population of the Marshall Islands is very, very small. I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the people. Um, it was only 15,000 people in 1960, and today it's on the order of 50 to 60,000 people. Um, the population growth is pretty, pretty fast, but on the other hand, it is a very, very small country. Um, the country is very poor. Um, this is the average income per family in some of the different um, atoll or islands where people are living. The, bat, the highest income people is only on the order of $12,000, and that is by the U.S. military base, which is <coughs> causing that one to go up. Otherwise, it's very, very you know, these numbers are like incredibly small per annual income, and Madro is the capital, is the next, the next time, but it's a poor country. Um, just another little fact, they depend on, in order to get water on the islands, it is dominated by um, rain. Basically, they collect rainwater. You can compare it to wells, which is 0.6% of their water. The second biggest like, piece of this pie is 10% coming from imported bottled water. But basically, if they have a drought, they're in trouble because that's how they get that water on these islands, and they do have drought problems. OK, the nuclear testing done by the United States were done in two places. And we talk up here, which is far away, is the, this atoll and the Bikini Atoll. The name bikini, the women's swimsuit, is totally tied to the nuclear testing because both were going to be explosive. So, in fact, Bikini Island came before the swimsuit. So that's, and that's where the name came from. Okay, yes, that's true. It's probably like the most famous word in the world because it's in every language, Russian, bikini, I think. I know it is in Serbian, so it's in Russian. Okay, so, uh, but anyway, it's the same word everywhere. So this is um, all the tests, all the bombs were done there. 
Okay, so overall, it's well documented. I'm about to show you all this. There are 67 nuclear tests that were done in the Marshall Islands between 1946 and 1958. Basically started right after World War II and then went, went up until there was a above ground test base. 18 of these tests were greater than a megaton. That means call those hydrogen bombs or fusion bombs. And on March 1, 1954 was the Castle Bravo bomb, the most famous bomb in terms of the US. Um, most powerful, 15 megatons that caused the most problem for the Marshallese people. And this is to be compared to Hiroshima, which is 23 kilotons. So you know, just much, 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 completely different scale. Okay, here is first of two pages I'm going to show you on all the tests. So there's a list, one, you know, one to 67, of every single bomb test, the date of the test, the name of the test, whether it was bikini or enemy top where that test was done, the type of test, and how much the yield was, whether it was a hydrogen bomb or you can just look at the numbers and be given in kiloton. Um, the very first hydrogen bomb ever exploded was a gigantic building. It was huge. It was 164,000 pounds. So it wasn't a deliverable bomb, but it tested the principle. It was done in enemy talk. It was called Mike, and it was you know 10 megatons. The one I'm going to talk quite a bit about today is this one, the Bravo bomb, um, this was 1954. It was 50 megatons, so a bit bigger, but it was compact. This is a deliverable bomb from an airplane, and um, even though it was blown up on the surface, on the ground. And this bomb is super controversial because that day, the wind was blowing towards the east, and the US said they made a mistake. Um, there's a big controversy whether or not they knew which way the wind was blowing. And it contaminated all the islands to the east where people were actually living. And so anyway, talk is here. Bikini was where the Bravo bomb was exploded. The wind blew east. Ronglot had fallout. Uteric had fallout. And people got cancer and got very sick due to just that one Bravo bomb. So from the Marshallese point of view, and we talk Bikini, Rondelop, and Uteric, where people really are living, are atolls that were damaged from nuclear weapons and need, you know, need compensation. So I'm going to call the northern Marshall Islands the contaminated. OK, here's the second page going down to 67. What is amazing here? I told you this was a test program over 12 years. The most interesting thing about this page is this. Half the bombs were dropped, were tested between May 1958 and August 1958. So bam, 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 bam. All these bombs were done in a few month period. Half the bombs that were dropped tested on the Marshall Islands. And that was because the US realized there was going to be a test ban that was coming up. So they just went, you know, just knocked away at this all in a few month period, which is just kind of amazing. OK, um, another thing I want to just point out, um, this is uh, became unclassified and then sort of got reclassified. There's something called Project 4.1. It's a study of response of human beings accidentally exposed to significant fallout radiation. There were many studies. Um, the US came in with medical doctors to help the Marshallese, but also used these, um, these, what they learned to study, basically, um, what it meant. To, you know, how many people got sick and how far away you were. And if you look at the distance in between the islands, sort of the distance between two atolls is comparable to the distance between New York and Washington. So um, you can actually learn about, a lot about hydrogen bombs and their impact by actually, uh, you know, what was learned by having people contaminated in the Marshall Islands. If you go to Wikipedia and keep digging a little bit on Project 4.1, you get all these links with all these interesting sounding articles about the nuclear test. If you try to click on any of the links, they're dead. So you can't get it. But you can see that on Wikipedia. So um, again, these articles probably really do exist, but they're actually not being allowed out. OK, so just to summarize where things are today with the Marshall Islands, um, this is the contaminated part. Most people live either in Kwajalein, which is where there's a US military base, or Montreux, which is the capital. In fact, here's the distribution of population. About half the people live in Montreux, and 20% live in Kwajalein because of um, the service that actually is helping the US military base. Um, so here's Kwajalein. I just want to blow it up. This is the US military base. It is the home of the Ronald Reagan missile test site. Um, it is actually part of this SDI program. And right here in Ebi, this little strip is where the Marshallese people live. 
So what is this all about? Um, basically, we know North Korea is a, a topic that's now in the news. Um, if North Korea is going to send ICBMs over to Hawaii or California over here, um, the goal of the Marshall Islands, and this is not how it's this is not necessarily the placement, but their goal in the Marshall Islands at this Kwajalein base is to shoot down missiles. And that's what this whole test center is about, um, just as the principle. Now, I want to point out that right next to this, um, this military base is Ebai. It's where 10,000 people live in 0.14 square miles. So it's incredibly crowded, incredibly poor. And so a big topic for the Marshallese is they are crowded on small little islands. And could they go back to the Northern Islands someday where their, their families were? So a big issue here that we got interested in when we visited the Marshall Islands in 2014 just to make this student film, and this is what sort of started everything, is should the Marshallese move back to the Northern Marshall Islands? The US government was saying some of the islands you could move back to. Marshallese didn't trust them because of a long history. And so we started getting involved with like looking at, oh, well, how radioactive are these islands? Let's just make first measurements. Um, the situation is extremely crowded conditions in the south. There are strong emotional ties to the people that want to go back to the homes where their parents and grandparents lived and were buried and so on. And the northern islands are visually absolutely stunningly beautiful. And I'll show you some pictures. Okay, so I went with four students on a trip to Enuitak, Bikini, and Rongelab on a boat trip. It's almost impossible to get to this place. Um, you just cannot even get an airplane there any longer. So you've got to take a boat, and this is where, what this adventure started. So how do you get there? It was almost impossible to find a boat that would go there. So the only way you can get to these islands is basically this boat. This is a boat for advanced scuba divers. And Bikini is one of the best scuba diving spots in the world, as I'll talk at the end, because there are all these ships that were sunk from the nuclear testing. Um, so we got onto this boat, and we did an over 1,000 mile boat trip Starting in Madro, which was stupid, that was the company like sticking it to me. Um, but basically, it should have started Kwajalein, but we went all the way out to we Dock, made measurements there, over to Bikini there, Rongelap, which was a really hot, really important topic, because US government says people can live in Rongelap, and the Marshallese said, we don't believe you at all. And so we were really interested in whether Rongelap, the radiation levels compared to Bikini and Enemy Talk, seemed um, what, what was going on. And people were living in enemy talk, so that was, that was really interesting to us, too, that there were people living where the nuclear tests were done. So we finally, after days of like throwing up on seasickness and so on, we got to enemy talk. Here is like what we saw, finally saw land, which was so nice. And um, that we made measurements of basically background radiation on three islands. One was enemy talk island, where 700 people were living. One, an island right next to it called Medrin. Both these islands were cleaned by the US military. The topsoil was scraped, and people were living on one of them. And then we went to an island that's very famous called Runit, which is basically a big nuclear waste dump. Now, Runit's famous. It's been all over the New, New York Times multiple times because it's an island which has, was capped by a concrete dome. It's got nuclear waste on it. Whoever made the picture for this talk from Berkeley took, I didn't choose the picture. It's actually the Runit Dome. And in fact, the, the big issue here is that um, this will go underwater due to sea level rise, and all this contamination is going to go all over the ocean. So that, that is why it's become an interesting topic. I think I have a video of us. Oops, what happened there? Um, let's see if it. Okay, I'm going to show it. Hopefully it is positioned correctly. Okay, we got to ruin it. This was one of the three islands. I want to show a two-minute video just like, this was back 2015. Drones had just come out, so this was like, we were kind of, wow, what is a drone? Like, you can buy drones. And so we actually got footage of Runet Dome. Um, and you'll see that actually some of the crew were actually walking on top of it. Um, but anyway, here's Runet Island. It's not a pretty island. It was where all the nuclear waste and so on was dumped. On the other hand, um, depending on your camera, the uh, ocean is really pretty. So like, the beach is really, really beautiful. Obviously, nobody's on the beach. Um, nobody's living there. But I'm going to show you. I'll let it run for a minute um, and basically show you what the dome looks like. So uh, this is actually the first time we ever flew the ground. 
Uh, we didn't want to. So anyway, we're heading. So we were down at the bottom, and over here, the dome roll appeared. And another thing kind of appeared. This interesting. So there, so you can see it. So this, this is you know, a Columbia footage of the dome. And over here, by the way, in this right here, beginning to appear, that is another big hole in the ground. This was a hole that was created by a nuclear bomb test, and right next to it is another hole filled with water, which is another nuclear bomb test. But this is one of the places where they're just like hitting bombs left and right. And um, this is, anyway, this is what it is. Uh, I might kill it, not to, yeah, not to waste my time. I'm worried a little bit about time. Okay, let me go on board. Okay, next is bikini. This is a picture, a shot I have of Bikini. It was actually raining there a bit, so, um, so there was actually a rainbow. It's a beautiful island, Bikini Island. Here we actually looked at, we did surveys on two islands, Bikini Island itself, where people wanted to go back and live, and also a little island called Nam, which was where the Bravo bomb was exploded. That used to be an island. It was mostly vaporized by the Bravo bomb. I'll come back to that. Okay, and then we went to Rondelap. That was our sixth island that we measured. This was the one we really cared about because this was the controversial as to whether it's, um, whether it's radioactive or not. And so we actually spent two days on Rondelap. That was our main goal. The rest were kind of like calibration measurements. Okay, so we published, we made measurements. I'm going to talk how we did it. We published it in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Um, it's almost all students, undergraduate students, um, the main person involved in the analysis, is Autumn, and Autumn was the one I pointed out who's sitting in this room, so she led the, this analysis, and this thing got published last June. So we went in um, August 2015, we published, it was out in print in um, June 2016, and let me tell you about it. So all we did, simplest thing in the world, we, we bought the most expensive Ludlum detector and walked around the islands and measured the radiation by pointing it at the ground and taking GPS points so we could actually make maps. And well, Everything I'm going to show you is in units of millirem per year, and so just this is like a unit of radiation, uh, which you probably all know. And I just want to remind people what is dangerous or not dangerous in terms of rem and millirem. Um, you get about 60 millirem per year in the U.S. on average just from background radiation. If you have radar in your home, you can get, actually if you're in Colorado, you're going to get up to a rem a year um, if you live in Denver, but basically on the order, it's rough. It, it ranges a lot depending on where you are, but hundreds of million rem per year. If you get an x-ray, it's about 60 millirems um, a year is the average sort of x-ray exposure. Um, to get a life-threatening situation, you're in rem. 400 to 1,000 rem to get sick or die, 1,000 to 500, 5,000 rem. So we are going to be talking about millirem numbers, which look like they don't matter and they're low, but, but I'm going to come, come to that topic. Okay, so here are our results. We went to six different islands. These are six different plots, one per island. All this plot here is millirems on the bottom on a logarithmic scale, and then number of counts, and this is just walking around the islands. And um, you'll see that in every plot there's a purple curve. That purple curve is a measurement of distribution from Madra, a southern island. So that's kind of like our control, that south is, should not be affected, and this is, this is so you can see how the distribution shifts. The important ones to look at, the, only, the three are Bikini, where we certainly found much higher levels of radiation compared to um, um, you know, the, our control. And then we talked, which had been cleaned, it actually really looked like that was done. In fact, you could almost argue this distribution is lower than the Madro, which so by scraping the topsoil, there really was not much gamma radiation from that. And we talked where people are living, so that's good news. And then Rondelap, which was sort of in the middle, and that was kind of interesting. It was on, I don't know, 20 or 30 millirem per year. Um, so again, these are small numbers. You say, well, who cares? This is all safe. Don't worry about it. Um, but, but here, just those trends are, are important to note. Okay, so once we had GPS points, we were able to make maps, and we even had like um, a way of fitting. Um, so you can actually make estimates of how much radiation were on the different islands. Bikini has sort of hot spots in the middle, and then we talk with actually kind of kind of flat. Okay, last plot, um, just to point things out. So here was the bikini number. It was uh, above 100 millirems per year on average. Here are the other um, islands, and here is Rongelap, which is only a, a little bit up. Um, so. When you look at this plot, you say, well, clearly the bikini number is above some sort of uh, agreed limit. This, there was an agreed limit after um, 
done in studies and in discussions between the Marshall Islands government and the U.S. government, that there be no above background radiation of more than 100 millirems per year from all channels, from all exposure pathways. So what we did was we walked around with radiation detectors and a bikini, for example, just from that one exposure pathway of just standing on the island, you have more radiation than what the um, U.S. and the Marshallese government agree should be the limit um, for people or for habitation. Um, what we realized is that, okay, there's no question the bikini is above that limit and therefore people should not move back there. The big issue, and I'll about come back to it, is not that this number of 100 millirems per year is high or something you worry about, it's what is the impact on food that you're going to put into your body. And that's, that's the point. So, um, first of all, just what happened, our publication went out. It was the top science article, according to Science News of the country, in June 2016. We did like nothing. We walked around an island, pointed at a detector. It trended on Facebook, and it got lots of press, just tons of articles, all of them wrong. Like, you know, this is the press. They did. We also measured Central Park, which had kind of high numbers of <coughs> granite, because we really did want people to understand what the numbers meant. And, get, and then people go, oh my god, I'm like living in radioactive Central Park, what, I'm going to die. And I said, don't eat the granite, you're fine. Okay, so that, but like I wanted people to learn some of this stuff. Okay, but here's one that's kind of funny. Radiate, first of all, they showed my, my picture and credited me, so I, that's why I'm showing it. But radiation levels on bikini toe found to exceed safety standards. A team of researchers from Columbia University in New York has found that all the Marshall Islands involved in nuclear tests by the U.S. are now habitable except for Bikini Atoll. That's just not true. It's not what we said. Um, we said the Bikini is not habitable. We did not say the others were. In fact, this were the conclusions if you read and like read the whole paper carefully. Okay. Um, bikini has radiation levels higher than what the U.S. and Marshallese government have agreed upon for resettlement just from one exposure pathway. Second, and it was, we taught cleaning was technically successful. It definitely brought the levels down below what exists, or equal to what exists in the southern Marshall Islands. Ram Galat could potentially be safe. It's not over the limit, you just don't know yet. And then our big concluding point is you need to measure the food. That is what matters. Small amounts of radiation in the food, if you eat it, that, that is what's going to be dangerous. Okay, so it took us two years um, how am I on time? Okay, I got 15 minutes. This will be fine. We went back a one-month boat trip, not two weeks, so this is brutal, went to all four of the northern atolls to measure the food. And this was a huge project. Basically, everything, everything that would be simple is complicated. Getting a 250-pound lead shield onto that boat in the Marshall Islands was an enormous project. No, you know, just getting it shipped there, you know, God knows what, I'm not sure why I wasn't using criminals to get it shipped in the end. Um, but, but anyway, it's like no airplane would fly. You cannot put 250 pounds on United, blah, blah, blah. So this was, uh, <laughs> you can imagine. Okay, so that, and we needed a lead shield. We were gonna take a coconut, cut it up, grind it up, make a coconut shake out of it, put it inside here with a, with a detector, and measure it for an hour in order to get enough statistics to be able to see the limit compared to the US um, FDA limit of whether this has too much radiation or not. Okay, so we were one month on a boat, boating around. We collected a total of 250 fruits, which is 250 hours inside the, the measurement device. We were running ships 24 hours a day as long as we were in the atoll where the ship's not rocking. In between atolls, we were just getting sick again, um, all, the, all these students, and there were eight students on the boats. And of course, you couldn't bring the fruits in. We couldn't take samples of the fruits. The U.S. won't let any fruits be imported, basically, especially through Honolulu. And anyway, a coconut's too heavy, and you know, that, so we did all the measurements on the boat. All the data collection was done on the boat. And we traveled to all four of the main atolls of the Marshallese government cared about it. Okay, so here's, I don't have results for you, because this is like from a few months ago, but this, you can see that we got it. Every fruit has a spectrum. So here's Uteric, which was actually quite far away, and um, I'm just giving you one fruit. This is like a coconut maybe from Bikini and a coconut from Uteric. I'm not even like giving you too much in terms of scale, but essentially you get the spectrum, it's the gamma spectrum from the fruit, 
and bam, you definitely see the cesium-137 peak in a fruit. And you can then, once we've got this calibrated, we can convert this into becquerel per kilogram, which is what the units you need in the end. So the, the analysis is, again, undergraduate is to actually estimate what that is. And that, that is a bikini fruit. That's not even the hottest one. I, I chose one that you can definitely see it, but you can clearly see that signal in the fruit. Um, this is what we will, in the end, be comparing to. Um, there's a big, you know, the Marshallese government, who we have very close relationships to, um, want to know, well, will we get cancer? They, and that's not a question that, you know, we're even going to be equipped to answer, because it means modeling, how you eat the fruit, statistics, and so on. But we're going to stop here. We're going to say, here's the US FDA derived intervention level. Um, for cesium, it's about 1,200 becquerel per kilogram. And all our fruits will be converted to that number. I'm going to see how many were up, over and under. I already know a bunch are way over from like Bikini Island. Um, the good news is that where people were living, it looks like the fruits were low. So that, that's nice news. All right, now, as I'm coming more towards the end of the talk, it gets even crazier. Um, so just like, you're on a boat a long time, you lose your mind. And so I had already lost it in the first trip because it bothered me that we were on an advanced scuba diving boat and not one person on that boat, any of the five of us had, could scuba dive. So I made it that all eight students had to be advanced scuba divers to get on the boat. So this was project two. Now this is the website of Indies Trader, which is the boat company. And just look at it, Bikini Dive Trip. This is, if you want to go to this company, the best wreck diving site on earth, okay? And look what you see. This bomb, was tested and there were lots of boats that were then sunk due to radiation. In fact, one of the most famous pictures on the cover of the Garwin book, by the way, is this picture. This is just a regular atomic bomb. It's a fission bomb. It's one of the first bombs that was exploded after World War II. It's done underwater. So all this water, this is not a cloud, this is water. So all this water is radioactive. And what you see here, all these are ships, okay? So this tent, there are tons of ships. So what happens, all these ships, this was a Navy test. The Navy was like, the Army's getting too much attention. We're going to see that our ships can survive nuclear weapons explosions. But what happened was about half the ships just sunk right away. And half didn't sink, so they declared a victory because half didn't. But everything was radioactive. And at the end of the day, they pretty much had to sink almost all the ships. So all these ships are underwater at Bikini Atoll at depths that you actually can dive to if you're an advanced diver. So that, that is what this statement's all about. So, we created at Columbia University a K-1 scuba diving team with sweatshirts and everything. I should have worn one today, probably. And I trained, had, you were not allowed on the boat unless you trained to advanced scuba training with rescue certification. That was it, that was, you had to get that level. At that point, we could do wreck diving to 100 feet, um, which is where one of the most famous ships that, that aircraft carriers that was sunk, the biggest aircraft carrier that, that was sunk and sunk upright. So it's actually kind of amazing. It didn't fall over sideways. Um, the bridge is at about 40 feet. The deck is about 100 feet in terms of diving. And these are things you can get to um, with, with scuba dive training. And then we realized over the two years that we could actually collect ocean sediment. And so this has become our last kind of big project. We collected some ocean sediment in Bikini. And amazingly, if you get a ocean sediment core, it is not regulated. You can import thousands of cores. There's nothing <laughs> stopping. And so we shipped it in. There's no limit. Obviously, these cores have bad stuff in them, but there's nothing that will stop you from shipping. So this is the Columbia students. I don't know. It's not a good view because like, it, it was kind of murky, the water that day. But it's the bridge of the Saratoga, the bikini Toll in May, and there were eight students. They were the ones who did the work, and it's all women. So they were the best ones who got in. They beat out all the guys, and those are the eight scuba divers who were on the boat. Okay, 2018, our next thing. What about the future? I'm coming to the end here. We would like to make, like, we want, this is, we are interested, now that we're really good at coring and we know how to do it, we want to make a radiation map of the Bravo crater. So, Here's a shot of the Bravo site. We walked this island now before and did some of our measurements there. It's about one mile in diameter. Um, and the depth, what's important here is the depth. The depth is 10 to 55 meters. Um, 
10 to 40 meters is recreational diving. So already those eight students could go back and they could do all the chlorine down to 40 meters. But when you go from 40 to 55, it actually becomes tech diving. But we are fearlessly going forward. So two of us, including me, went to Mexico to learn how to tech dive. So this is actually me. These are two tanks on my back. It's 100 pounds, um, basically. If I misstep on this sand, I basically break my leg. So every day was like one bad step, and this program is dead. Um, but basically, we went to Playa del Carmen. Two of us became tech divers, so we can go down to the 50, 55 meters. Um, here's like a shot. Um, in Mexico, the currents are really strong. So it's like, it's called drift diving. You jump in the water, and you're pushed far away. You have to deploy a buoy, or the boat will never find you. Um, so uh, this is us learning underwater, basically, how to do the buoy deployment. Now, tech diving is super dangerous. Um, you go down to these depths, you spend a little time there, and it's called a deco dive. It's like you cannot just shoot to the surface because you will dive from decompression sickness. So you've got to go up in stages, and you've got to be able to stay in a level. And so it actually was a big deal learning how to do this. OK, but there are benefits too. Look at the sea turtle. <laughs> Yay. OK, anyway, onward. I'm going to now end the talk almost. i got two more slides, or three, really. And I'm ending with Konofsky's ending. This was how he ended his talk on nuclear weapons. Look, no one can probably say it better than him. He basically was in favor of a prohibition on nuclear weapons in the world, just like there is on chemical and biological weapons. And he even states prohibition is not elimination. We know the chemical weapons have been prohibited, but they even have been used, right? Certainly since, since Pete um, passed away. But nevertheless, um, he strongly believed in that we should have a prohibition um, internationally. He said, this will be a protracted process, but the US has most to gain from such a prohibition and must take leadership towards that end. This is not going well these days. And then his last statement is, the US should do no less or we will leave a very insecure world to our children. So my very last slide is, like, deep down in my heart, the reason I'm doing this is to keep this guy safe in New York City. Um, my little, you know, 17 kilogram, 18 kilogram um, human. So that's that. All right, that's my talk. Thank you. Question. Pretty nuts, huh? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah, we looked, we didn't look at, ah, there's a good story. We, um, we looked at some fish. We couldn't really find reef fish. We didn't spend enough time on it. Um, when we measured fish that were swimming around, we didn't see any radiation. We did, like, maybe five fish. But that's five hours of work. Like, we were more concerned with statistics for our fruit. We didn't see anything in fish. We did have a cool story. On one island, which was radioactive when you walked around it, and the coconuts were radioactive, we found a coconut crab. We killed the coconut crab, chopped it up, put it in our detector, and it was radioactive. So that was like a full food chain. Coconut crabs eat coconuts, and coconuts were radioactive. So yeah, that, but, but in terms of fish that were going around in the lagoon, we did five, but we didn't find any. So, and we didn't do enough statistics. And, and really, they got to be eating off the reef of a radioactive island or, or a well old matter. Yes? Oh, you mean shipping samples? Yeah. You can bring, you can bring biological you could bring biological samples back. In fact, I just spoke on Friday to, a, uh, to an oceanographer from Stanford who actually went to Bikini on the same boat and brought back samples. So you can bring back biological samples. Uh, well, you couldn't. You, the, the, the rule with fruits is if I took a, a coconut and didn't touch it, I could bring it back. But you know how heavy a coconut is? Like, I can put 10 on the airplane and like, there goes my space limit, including the $100 extra for the bag. Um, you're allowed maybe three bags max on an airplane, certainly with United. And United, by the way, is the only, it's a joke, but it's the only airline that flies the Marshall Islands. They have a monopoly. Um, but 
You can bring back a whole coconut, you cannot chop it up. Once you open it up, they will not allow it in. So there are rules coming from basically import rules on food. No, you couldn't. They, they, uh, you have to get special permission. We ship soil. There's a whole other story beyond that. Yes? So two questions. First, um, in your coconuts, did you look at all of that top of beta emitters? No, no. We, we, in the agreement between the Marshallese and the U.S., they cared about only two things. They cared about season 137 and plutonium. And so it's really, you know, the, the literature out. There have been studies done by Livermore on this up and like strontium and so on. The, le are, the levels are supposedly lower than these two. The two big dangers are plutonium and cesium, supposedly. And we went with that. And so we're just like measuring the cesium which we could do. We are interested in the plutonium. And then, and then yeah. the second question was, um, as far as shipping a lot of heavy food, is there any way to do a partnership with, say, like military cargo planes? Because I bet they fly in a lot. Yeah, I'm not sure the military love us. Because <laughs> 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 like, we're checking what they do. We've had some issues there. <laughs> Let's say they're, uh, I mean, immediately after this paper, the military contacted me and said, hey, let's publish together from now. But the Marshallese, like, I went to a Marshallese conference, and the first question I was asked is, who's funding this? And when I said Columbia University, the room was, oh, it's not the military. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So. What? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Look, it's about money and funding and, and, and so But basically, um, there have been lots of studies, but there's a funny history to have the person, the group that's involved in studying the bomb, making it, all classified information be the same group that is deciding whether or not it's safe. It, there are, there's potential conflicts of interest there, if you think about it. They don't want to look back because they dropped the bomb, right? Yeah. Um, the vegetation looked pretty healthy around the dome. Uh, are there any... Uh, what looked... Oh, oh the, the vegetation. Plants, the plants, right. Uh, is there some reason for that? In other words, is, or do you know how much radiation is necessary to kill a palm tree and that sort of thing? No, no, I don't, I don't really know anything about what's inside that dome. Um, we know that it's, it's got dangerous chemicals, it's got plutonium, so inside the dome. Um, on the other hand, things do, look, bikini everywhere, things are growing. There's no doubt that it's not stopping life from growing, but the, the stuff that's growing is radioactive. Yes, Aaron, or whatever. So I guess I'm, one, the, a message from your work, which I find kind of surprising, is that actually the radiation levels are pretty manageable. And the They're low. Something like you could nuke the hell out of the place, and then somehow like 50 years later you can just come back and live. Well, it's tricky. Place. They clean <laughs> bikini some. That's one thing. And we don't know how much. Um, you get 70 years later, many of the isotopes are gone. The cesium-137 is still dangerous. Um, you don't have the results of how many of those fruits are dangerous. Um, I guess you could see it positively that hundreds of miles away, you know, it, it could. It is, look, I admit, it's, it's surprising. Well, Hiroshima, people live in Hiroshima, right? Um, I was surprised that people are living in it, we talk, and they cleared the land, and the numbers appear to be low. So I was just completely shocked when I learned a year later, the people live in enemy talk where the bombs were actually tested. That it was a mind blow for me. Yeah. Yes. Joe, people drink a lot more water than they eat food. Supplementary. Yes. No, we didn't test the water. I mean, they are getting most of the water from rain. Almost all, not groundwater. The rain collects. The rain that they collect. So this is coming from, you know, clouds in the sky. So. So they collect, are they collecting? They collect them in big barrels, and that's, that's what they're using for drinking water. Um, on the other hand, the water table matters because of the food. I think it's the food, the, it's really the fruit. They, people who live on the northern islands live off fish and fruit, and then they import rice, and that's basically the main, the main source of the food. And the rice is coming from outside. So. Yes? Is it normal to have with the stuff that they remove? They just dump it in the ocean some a few hundred miles away? No, they dumped it on Runin, for example. Oh, you mean what, in Bikini, or I... Like the soil they removed. I believe that most of the soil they removed, they dumped in Runin, I'm going to guess. 
it's at least for NOE talk. They like cleaned NOE talk and moved, shipped it up, it's not that far away, and dumped it in RUNIT and put a dome over it. The cleanup of NOE talk was all focused on RUNIT. That's why RUNIT is just filled with all the bad stuff. And that's the one that's going underwater, and that's the one that's a very hot topic in the world. So, since this dome, they want Oh, that was a big article in the New York Times, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I have no com There are lots of, yeah, complaints about that. We didn't, we're not doing anything really politically of dealing with the world. We're just like going there and making science measurements and hopelessly publishing them. And that, and informing the Marshallese government what we're doing. So, and with the idea that it's a bunch of students, we're not going to lie, right? So there's no agenda. It's like, if it's radioactive, we'll say it. If it's not, we'll say we didn't find it. Yes? Soil? No, so we collected, um, we did a first test. We collected 20 soil samples from all these different islands, but only 20. We knew that there was all sorts of import restrictions, but you're allowed to say, you're allowed to, and this was from plutonium. We can send the soil samples into a company and have it measured. Um, but we, there were two of us who had FDA approval to send in 10 like test tubes of soil. And that worked. We were, we were told it wouldn't even work, but we went to the, like, the post office in Kwajalein and just shipped this thing over and said it was soil and we had approval for it. But it was a very small amount. So it was like, next time we go there, if there are 10 people on the boat, everyone will do 10 samples and I'll have 100 and that'll be, yeah. But I real, it wasn't clear. I was told by the Marshallese and by even the US, you're never going to get the soil here, but well, we got 20 of them here. So we pro proof of principle. We don't have results, no. Like all the soil, oh by the way, we had tons of cores. Like we have lots of ocean sediment from bad places. So that's, and that's unrestricted. So we're gonna learn how, I, there's a big interest in, is the ocean contaminated? And so that, we're, we're gonna learn that actually. And it's probably not gonna be a nice answer to that one. So, because you can't clean the ocean floor. That's, that's that. Yes? The title of your talk includes uh, Mess. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to get people in the room. I know. Yeah. Real responsibility. Yeah. Able Baker test at the key high school. Yeah. Yeah, it was 15. So much worse, yeah. I thought it was a big devil, but anyway, there was yeah. this uh, Bohemian Dragon, was I don't remember what right. that was connected with. But yeah, that was the problem. Just the winds were going uh, east. Going really to the east, east. That, that ship got yeah. contaminated, so did the people in Rongelab. And, and they, for a while, we were yeah. hearing about electromagnetic pulse, those of us who tried to teach seminars on science, technology, and right. so forth. Right. Yep. I think for the Bravo test, the EFP got to Chile. Yeah. yeah, knocked out, yeah. Yeah, it was, it was like a huge, yeah. I mean, the Bravo test was the biggest disaster for the Marshallese of the nuclear testing program, by far, no question. There's a book, by the way, uh, Our Nuclear Future, written by Teller, and I think it was Ladder or Lattice. Yeah. Uh, Ladder, Lattice, and he was still hoping that nuclear something was done, but the nuclear devices are carving out markets in the last year. Yeah, it's probably not a good idea, though. Yeah, right, right. Given how good Tim is. Okay. I was just curious the name of the project, K1, what do you call it? Oh, K1? Oh, it's like K equals 1 is sort of the criticality constant in nuclear, you know, like a nuclear reaction. And then the young people named it, and they said, I mean, I should actually ask, ask the person in the room who was at the Naming meeting. <laughs> right, right, okay, she was there, I was there. It was students who named it. And they also thought the topic was critical. So, yes? Uh, I was at Oak Ridge as a summer student back in the streets. I started to say something, so I was like, well, there's 53, I was there. And I was talking about the critical experiments. I was talking about the aircraft reactor. Right. Yeah, that's what it was. My recollection is that KM was a little day, it was all reactivity. 
Right. Right, 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 exactly. Okay. Well, thank you.